Welcome back, everyone. My name is Brian. We're going to continue our journey into Python. All right, so we're going to talk about a few different things with threading, and we're really leaving beginner land and just jumping headfirst into advanced territory here. So we want to avoid a few things. For example, the dreaded race condition and deadlocks. If you don't know what these are, a race condition is the same resource, notice I didn't say variable, the same resource modified by multiple threads pretty much at the same time or close to it. We have to have something called locking and that's what we're going to cover in this video. Now the problem with locking is you can create another issue called a dead lock which is multiple threads waiting on the same resource. So think of it this way. Think of your computer as a giant cookie jar. Now the problem is the mouth of this cookie jar is only big enough for one person to reach in at a time. So if you have multiple people trying to reach in at the same time, either they're going to reach a deadlock, meaning neither of them can get in, or they're both going to magically get in, but then neither of them can pull their hand out. Ugh, that is confusing. We're also going to touch on another subject, and I'm going to just copy and paste this giant text wall here. Bang! It's going to be out on GitHub in case you want to read this whole thing, but I will summarize we're going to talk about the GIL or the Global Interpreter Lock. And Python gets a lot of flack for threading because it handles threading differently than other languages. And to just dispel with some myths and rumors, yes, Python is truly multiple threaded. What I mean by that is when you create a thread, you can actually see on the operating system a thread is created. The problem is all of this bottlenecks into Python in the GIL. And what this is, is basically one thread, one CPU at any given time. It just does it blistering fast. So from our program's perspective, we can have multiple threads and they appear to be all working in unison. But really under the hood, CPython supports multiple threads within a single interpreter. Meaning so far we've been working with just one instance of Python, which means these threads all go through one gill. There's one door they're all trying to run through at the same time. To kind of circumvent all that after reading all of this, you have to use something called multi-processing, which is using multiple Python interpreters running in tandem. Highly advanced topic we're going to cover later, but I want you to understand as we talk about threading, someone's going to say, oh, Python's not truly multi-threaded. Well, it is. It just has this global interpreter lock, and there are ways around it you have to use multiprocessing, which is blistering fast, but uses more RAM. So let's dive in and let's take a look. First things first, we need our imports and we're gonna make a global here. So I'm going to, just for the sake of time, so you're not watching me type all this crap out. There we go. We're gonna import logging, threading, and the concurrent features. We're going to import the thread pool executor. We've covered all these in previous videos, which is why I'm not taking the time to really dive in each one of these. We are going to stop the current thread and we're going to use a random number generator. But additionally, we want to use a global variable. And that's why I wanted to slow way down at this point and say, this is where we're going to have problems. Counter equals zero. This looks very innocent and we've done this before, but now we're talking about multiple threads. So take a moment and just really absorb what we're doing. We're making a global variable called counter. We're going to spin up multiple threads and increment this counter. What could possibly go wrong? Remember, what we're talking about is thread locking. A race condition is multiple threads accessing the same resource. What are we doing here? We're making a single resource that multiple threads are going to access. Let's take a look at how Python actually works with threads. Let's go ahead and set up our test function. This is what we're going to call the threads on. Or I should say the function is going to be called on the thread. So I'm going to say def test, and we want some sort of count that we're going to increment our counter with. We're going to use that global variable, counter. And we're going to go ahead and get the thread name. And this is going to be the threading. And we've done this before, so I don't want to spend a whole ton of time on this. If you miss the videos, definitely go back and rewatch. There are 45 other videos in this series so far. I'm going to make a lot more. 
but we've talked about what the current thread is and how to get into it. Also, we're going to make a wild assumption that logging is actually set up at this point. We covered that in a previous video where you have to configure logging before you work with it. We're doing it a little bit backwards here. We're going to start using it before it's really configured. We'll catch up with that in a moment. So we're going to say starting and then whatever our thread name is. And we're going to mess around with this function a little bit over the next few segments, but I just want to flesh this out really quick so you get an idea of what we're going to be doing here. So we're going to say for x in range, very simple. And we're going to range on the count, which is the argument that we're given. And then we're just going to say logging, and I want to do count. Thread name plus equals, and we want the out just so we can see what's actually going on here. We're going to play around with this, and I'm going to show you locking and unlocking and acquiring and releasing and all that, but I really just want to show that this is what's going on. So now, once we're done, we just want to say completed whatever our thread name actually is. So this is going to be our test function. Now, right in here is where we're going to do some work. I'm going to put a note, work here. OK, now that we've got a test function, we're going to go ahead and do our main function. So done all of this before, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time explaining what all this is. Highly recommend you go out and watch the other videos just so you understand what's going on in case you skipped any of them. So we're just going to make sure that Python knows if we're running as main to run the main function. And then inside the main function, I'm going to copy and paste some config code here. So we're going to configure our log using basic config. And we're going to say level sync time. Now, one little bit you should notice is instead of just string, I have dot and then the milliseconds, three decimal places. So I want to know the actual milliseconds, and we're going to log that. And then in the rest of it's just the same thing we've been doing with the hours, minutes, seconds. It'll have the milliseconds behind it, and we're logging debug, so we're collecting everything. Now from here, I'm going to the old copy and paste. My mouse wants to work. We're going to say app finished. And then in between, this is where we're going to actually kick off our thread pool executor, which we've talked about in the previous video. So I'm say workers equals and we just want two threads that we're going to use in the pool with and I want thread pool executor go ahead and set our max workers equals workers that way we're telling the thread pool executor use only two workers as and I'm just gonna say as ex and then for x in range and I want to do the workers times two. So basically I want to do more work than workers. That way we can actually see the thread pool in action and it does, well, exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And missed a little, there we go. Now I want to get a value and we're going to say just a random number. And I want a rand range. We've done this dozens and dozens of times, but basically we're making a random number between one and five. Now I want ex.submit, and we haven't talked about this before. We've talked about map, which does the map function. Submit is a little bit different, similar syntax, but different. So we're saying a function and a parameter. So we're directly calling a function here. See, some sort of callable function with arguments. So really what we're doing is saying thread pool, submit to this function a value. And it's going to call this little guy right here. Beautiful how that works. I absolutely love that. It's so simple to use. It's just ridiculous. So this is to a function with an argument. And then from there, it's very, very simple. Let's go ahead and just run this just to see what happens. And you can see we have no errors and it actually does kick up some threads in the thread pool. Okay, if you've been paying attention so far, we have a multi-threaded application that's doing, well, basically nothing. We're starting a thread pool, we're submitting to a function, and then this is being called up, but we have this work here. So we haven't actually done anything yet. That's gonna change. We're gonna look at the global 
interpreter lock or the gill. What is it and why does it exist? Think about what we're doing here. We're taking a global variable across multiple threads and we're going to modify it. This is very, very bad. So I'm going to say counter plus equals. And let's go ahead and increment this by, uh, hmm, what do I want to do here? Let's go ahead and just add one just to see it work. Now, if you've come from another programming language and you know threading, you know this is very, very bad. Because what have we just done here? Well, we've created a race condition because multiple threads are hitting this simultaneously. You can see down by our hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, this is firing off at the same millisecond. So race condition is notorious for crashing programs because what happens is the program doesn't know the value. Let's say the program's in the process of modifying this and another thread comes in and tries to modify it. What's the actual value? That's when the program gets confused and ultimately just crashes. Let's see it in action. No crash. Notice that. No crash at all. Application finished. So what's going on here is, well, you may have guessed a global interpreter lock is coming in and saying, nope, only one thread at a time through the door. And we can even test this by getting that actual count, just to make sure this is an actual integer and nothing has exploded here. So let's just clear this out and run again. So we have a count of seven. Now you can play around, and this is admittedly a bit watered down or simplistic or almost silly example because we're doing basically no work. But I want to dumb it down so we understand the concept of the race condition and what we've just done. This is why the global interpreter lock exists. It makes threading in Python ridiculously simple. We don't even have to worry about locking this, even though we should. So we're going to cover locking in the next segment, but just understand what we've done here. Multiple threads at the same time are hitting this resource and modifying it. So far, we've been trusting Python to take care of all the murky details for us, but I'm not a trusting individual, so we're going to do this the right way. We're going to use what's called locking. And this is kind of intimidating, but we now control that resource. So I'm going to say lock equals threading dot lock. And when you see the word lock in context of threading, Think of it literally like a lock on a door. We are now shutting that door and locking it so no other thread can go in and mess with it. But to do that, we have to actually acquire the key. Now, because we've acquired the key and locked the door, we have to unlock the door now before anything else can be done. So let's do this. We're going to say try, finally. And we're going to literally just copy this code here. And then we're going to say lock release. And release is, well, literally unlocking the door so other threads can now go in and do it. Notice the structure here. Only the resources we're going to modify are between lock and release, or I should say acquire and release, because we want this window of opportunity to be very, very small. That's what's going to keep our applications nice and nice and fast. Now, Doing this is great and all, but there's another little issue. Let's go ahead and run this just to show you that it does actually work. Ta-da! Now, let's go ahead and we're going to actually create a deadlock. So let's say we accidentally did something like this. So this is a deadlock. What we're doing now is we're saying we are now waiting on resources. Because this is locked, the door's locked, we can't get in. But now someone else is saying, hey, try and open the door. The door is locked. Oh, that is super frustrating. So what's going to happen here is you notice how it just stops. So whenever you see a multi-threaded application just stop like this, how it's just sitting here forever and ever, and it's not going to crash, it's just going to sit here, you have just ran into a deadlock. So if you're ever sitting around at work and somebody says, hey, why is my thread stopping? It's a deadlock. That's really what's going on. 
Now, so far, all of this has been great and all, but it's also very ugly. So we're going to do something called locking simplified. And if you played around with this code a little bit, you'll notice that, well, Python takes care of a lot of the details for us, so we don't even have to worry about it. So let's go ahead and comment all this out. Just going to keep it here. That way, if anybody grabs the source code, they can see what I did. So locking simplified. We're going to stay away from this try finally, and we want to lock and immediately unlock. So I'm going to say lock equals threading.lock. And now I want to say with lock. And we could have said with threading.lock, but I'm just showing you that we have some sort of variable here. So with lock, and what's going to instantly happen is we're going to acquire that resource and then release the resource when it's no longer needed. This is incredibly cool. So I'm going to just grab this. And we're going to paste some code in there. So I'm going to say, so let's change that to plus one. Time sleep too. So each time we do this, we're going to sleep. I'm slowing this way down. So just to scroll up, I know we got a lot of comments here. I'm gonna enter test. We're gonna grab that counter. We're going to grab the thread name, do some logging, and then 4x in range count. We're gonna go ahead and say, get a lock, lock and acquire, do something, go to sleep and release. So I'm intentionally slowing this way down so you can see it in action. Save and run, and you can see it's going, going, going. It almost looks like it's locking it because we're putting all the threads to sleep. And eventually this will finish out. Ta-da! Everything's working as expected. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find the source code out on github.com. If you need additional help, myself and thousands of other developers are hanging out in the Void Realms Facebook group. This is a large group with lots of developers, and we talk about everything technology related, not just the technology that you just watched. And if you want official training, I do develop courses out on Udemy.com. This is official classroom style training. If you go out there and the course you're looking for is just simply not there, drop me a note. I'm either working on it or I will actually develop it. I will put a link down below for all three of those. And as always, Help me help you. Smash that like and subscribe button. The more popular these videos become, the more I'll create and publish out on YouTube. Thank you for watching.